An all-time favourite movie is The Sound of Music. People love the start with Julie Andrews standing on a beautiful mountain with her arms stretched out, twirling around singing, the hills are alive with the sound of music. She is playing the part of a woman who is so full of joy and happiness that she can't restrain the music that is in her heart. Well now today we are going to look at two other women whose hearts are so full they can't help but sing and they're not acting. A leading medical doctor recently wrote an article for a national newspaper. It had this headline, Sing Your Heart Out and Wear a Warm Scarf. The subtitle was Some Simple Tips to Keep Well This Winter. The benefits of singing was one of them, not just when our mood is good. It will help us with our stress levels and will improve our immune system. Good research has gone into this. Singing is a very practical thing for our well-being, not just listening to singing. It fights infections. So that, apart from any other good reason, is reason enough to sing some carols heartily this Christmas time. Luke must have loved music because we hear the songs of Elizabeth, Mary, Zachariah and Simeon in the first two chapters of his Gospel. And by the way, carols were sung in Europe thousands of years ago. They were not Christian but part of the pagan winter solstice. Sometimes you hear people talk about how we need to put Christ back into Christmas. I won't disagree, but he wasn't in it right at the beginning. In Luke 1, 39 to 56, we see two women coming together for a visit. Now, already Angel Gabriel has told young Mary that her relative Elizabeth was expecting a child. Talk about a surprise to Mary. Because Elizabeth was old and thought to be unable to have children. Well, let's pick up the story beginning in verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women! and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Well, now first, Look at Elizabeth's response. It's likely that Mary left almost immediately after Gabriel's visit. Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy when Gabriel visited Mary and she stayed for three months. Mary got ready and hurried. She wanted to check out Gabriel's statement and she was probably very anxious to get away from Nazareth. This was a surprise visit. How do we know? Mary entered Elizabeth's house before she greeted her. The social customs were clear about the rules of hospitality. Knowing a guest was coming, the host or hostess waited outside the house to be the first to greet their guest. Only after this initial greeting would the guest be invited into the house. Mary surprised Elizabeth, entering the house before she greeted her. You know how some women don't like to have unannounced company, do they? And that's sometimes very understandable. But Elizabeth was overjoyed 
and she responds to Mary's visit with this spontaneous song. And just like Elizabeth, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Dr. Luke has more to say about the Holy Spirit than the other Gospel writers. He penned the book of Acts, which can be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Gabriel had told Zachariah that their son John would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. How was that possible? Well, it's because his mother was filled with the Holy Spirit. Parents, our spiritual condition will go a long way to determine the level of spiritual depth of our children. What does our Bible command? Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. When we are saved, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but that is not the same as being filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit, we are under the control of the Spirit. And Paul contrasts it with being drunk with wine. You know how a drunk person is under the influence of that toxin and that's bad? A Christian filled with the Spirit is under the influence of God's Spirit. And you know what? That's good. Being drunk affects the way a person thinks, walks, acts and talks, fill with the Spirit, affects the way we think, we act and we speak. The words that Elizabeth speaks are not her own. She is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it's our job to stay filled with God's Holy Spirit. It's not some freaky experience that makes us act weird. It's a continual surrender that makes us act normal. Do we know what attitudes and actions being filled with the Spirit bring about? We do because we see them in Elizabeth. She was filled with enjoyment. Her unborn baby was leaping for joy in her womb. That had to cause her great joy. I can remember when my wife was expecting, she would say, put your hand here on my stomach. It's hard to describe the thrill that both of us would feel to know that there was a little person in that womb moving around. What a jolt of joy. Elizabeth must have experienced when she heard Mary's voice and felt her unborn son leaping for joy. By the way, the abortion debate continues about when life begins. Here is an unborn child who is alive and seems to be very aware. Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud voice. She was full of joy and excitement. Paul tells us that joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Someone said to me, I'm a perfect example of the grumpy old man. I'm really good at it. Well, when we are filled with the Spirit, we will produce the beautiful fruit of joy in our personality. How do we spot a person who is not filled with the Holy Spirit? Answer, there will be no joy in their life. And joy and enthusiasm are twins. Joy is what we experience personally. Enthusiasm is how to express that joy to others. The English word enthusiasm comprises of two Greek words, en meaning in and theos meaning God. And the more in God we are, the more enthusiastic we will be. Joy is the birthright of every true believer. Have we lost the joy of our salvation? 
And not only that, filled with the Holy Spirit, not only will there be enjoyment, but also enlightenment, the revelation of spiritual truth. Jesus promised that when he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us, he would guide us into all truth. And Elizabeth makes some amazing observations because she has been filled with the Holy Spirit. She knows by divine revelation that Mary is going to have a child. And she acknowledges this before Mary can tell her about Gabriel's visit. And she recognises that Mary's child would not be just any child. She asked the amazing question, but why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, most parents prefer to boast about how great their own children are, but not Elizabeth. The filling of the Holy Spirit produces true humility. Notice what Elizabeth says about Mary's unborn child. She calls him my Lord. And as far as we know, Elizabeth is the only person to confess Jesus is my Lord while he was still unborn. What? Well, what incredible spiritual insight she must have had to be able to recognise that this little boy would be her Lord and the Lord of everyone else. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Well, Elizabeth proclaimed it first, but she won't be the last. Notice the final inspired thing that Elizabeth says to Mary is encouragement. She calls her blessed because she was believing the Lord. Remember, Mary is an unmarried teenager facing a pregnancy outside of marriage. She had to be uncertain about all of what was being involved here. And what an encouragement to hear Elizabeth greet her by confirming what Gabriel had told her. Mary, you are blessed among women. Notice she didn't say you are blessed above women. One reason we are to gather together for worship is to encourage one another. And when we are filled with the Spirit like Elizabeth, we won't be focusing on getting a blessing as much as being a blessing to others. Like the line in an old song says, church should be a place where seldom is heard a discouraging word. Sadly, for many people, they leave church saying where seldom is heard an encouraging word. Our job is to encourage others, to make sure they leave church being built up in the faith. And we are to be filled with the same Holy Spirit who filled Elizabeth 2,000 years ago. How can we tell when we are filled? We will be expressing enjoyment, joy and enthusiasm. We will have enlightenment, unusual spiritual insight into God's truth. And we will be a supernatural encouragement to others. Okay, but what about Mary's response? Verse 46. Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, 
for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. And this is Mary's song. It's been called the Magnificat because that is the Latin translation of the first word in her song. Mary is so steeped in scripture that when she breaks out in praise, the words just come naturally to her lips, the words of scripture. What a challenge to us to steep our minds in the scriptures so that the words and the thoughts of scripture fill our mouths as naturally as they did young Mary's. In fact, she quotes five Psalms in her song. Mary was a woman who was so saturated in the word of God that her spontaneous song is filled with scripture. And this beautiful song of Mary tells us a great deal about worship. Look at the setting for Mary's worship. Mary's location was in Elizabeth's little home. You know, sometimes people think the only place to worship is the church, the church building. And the only time to worship is on a Sunday. Any time. And any place is pr a proper setting for worship. But a great time to worship God is when facing troubling circumstances in our lives. You see, it's easy to worship God when everything is going great. But what about when our life is falling apart? When our life is pain-free, worship is a luxury, but worship is a necessity when struggling. I think Mary was very, very troubled as she expressed this beautiful song of worship. She knew she was pregnant with the Messiah. God himself was in her womb. She couldn't tell her parents or Joseph not just yet. So these were very confusing days for her. And today, there are thousands of unwed teenage pregnancies. But in the time of Mary, this was rare. And there was a heavy social stigma attached. Mary could have been accused of adultery. And the sentence was stoning. In Matthew, we are told that when it was discovered Mary was expecting a child, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, we know an angel visited Joseph and explained the situation, so he did marry Mary. But look at those two words, think about them. Public disgrace, public. Can't you see her throwing clothing into a bag and hurrying three days south to reach Elizabeth's home? Every step she took, she thought of the words of Gabriel. She had to have been perplexed and confused about it all. This expression of praise was her way of totally surrendering herself to God's plan. Some of you listening to me 
have tough problems and struggles. Look, don't let pain keep you from worshipping God. This is the very time to worship. There's a great line from a song. For the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise him. And true worship begins on the inside of our heart and works its way out. Mary starts by saying, my soul glorifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. Worship comes from, do you see this, inside. It bubbles up and bubbles over. It's not coming to church. It's not singing a hymn alone. It's not reading words in a Bible, hearing a sermon. It's not carrying out a ritual, even communion. Those are potential effects of a worshipping heart. But they can't stand alone as true worship. It's the inner heart of adoring praise that is the essence of true worship. It's worship from the heart. It ought to upset us when a crowd gathers in the name of Jesus, but only shallow worship occurs. A pastor was visiting a couple. As he rang the doorbell, he heard the lady singing, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Knowing she was a casual church worshipper, he commented on how delighted he was to hear her song. And she said, oh, I always sing it when boiling eggs, three verses for soft and five for hard. Mary shows us that a humble heart is the kind of heart that produces real music, real worship, not just lip service. When she says, my soul glorifies the Lord, it literally means to make larger. My soul is making the Lord bigger and bigger in his position of honour in my life. Parents may say to a child, how big are you? And they go on their toes saying, I'm so big. Guys, when your wife shows you a new dress and asks, are my hips okay in this? Don't say, they are so, don't even go there. But do go there in a greater way with God when worshipping. The smaller our ego becomes, the larger the Lord can become in our life. And true worship sees ourself as more and more insignificant and God as being greater, stronger and more awesome. That's a great principle about the attitude of worship. We get smaller, God gets larger in our hearts. But then this inner expression results in an expression of joy. Mary sings, my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. Literally, unspeakable joy. It's an out loud kind of joy, a joy that is unconstrained. Worship begins with a humble recognition of who we are in comparison to God's greatness. Everybody on this planet worships everybody. The difference is who or what do we worship. We all worship something or someone. Our problems come from worshipping the wrong things. Know what I mean? Relationships, money, pleasure. If anxiety and nervousness control us, nothing less than reassigning value to what really matters is the answer. 
And as we improve at worshipping, we will gain a greater security. Mary's song of praise is focused only on God and his wonderful character. You see, worship begins on the inside with a humble recognition that God is great. But true worship always comes out from the heart through the lips to become an outward expression of praise. Most often, it's a verbal expression. Mary sang it. Inner appreciation always expresses itself in outward adoration. In other words, your praise will be communicated in a way that others can understand it and be blessed by it. And notice what Mary says about God. He is called her saviour. Those that claim Mary was sinless all her life have a hard time explaining how she would need a saviour. But she needed a saviour, just like we do. He is called the Mighty One. His name is holy. He is merciful. He is stronger than all the kingdoms of men. He fills the needy with good things. He is the God who keeps his promises to Israel. Do you see this? Mary is showing us that worship is all about God and his greatness, not about us. Disagreements about worship styles has infiltrated many churches. The issue is the style of worship, which for most people means the style of music used in worship. Music is just one part of worship, but it is an important part. And different generations prefer different worship styles, which usually means different music styles. We must come to realise that in worship, substance is more important than style. God doesn't judge worship based on the style of the music. He judges it based on the heart of the worshipper. Jesus said to the Father, is seeking people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. I can almost hear God saying, quit arguing over the kind of music you use and worship me. A spirit-filled person is so focused on worshipping God, they seldom notice the style. Elizabeth is a good example. I'm so glad that elderly Elizabeth didn't scoff at the teenaged Mary by saying, that's okay, Mary, but I don't care for your style of music. After all, you are a teenager. Considering music styles, I prefer, personally, what is called blended style of music. I don't want to stop singing the beautiful old hymns of the faith, but neither do I want to omit singing the newer songs that committed Christians have written. In the 18th century, new radical songs like Blessed Be The Name, written by Charles Wesley, were banned in respectable churches. And do you know why? Because the chorus sounded too much like some popular drinking songs. God is the only qualified worship critic in the universe. And the last time I checked, there wasn't a vacancy in the Trinity. I'm convinced that God receives and appreciates true worship, whatever the style, if it comes from a heart full of love. The reason I like a blended style is because the churches I'm involved with, more or less, are multi-generational churches. And therefore we aren't targeting just the younger crowd or the older crowd. We are targeting anyone who needs Jesus. Well, here's the point. Don't focus on the worship style. 
Focus on God and his greatness. Worship is all about honouring God, not about pleasing ourselves. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sometimes a person says, I just don't get much out of worship anymore. Whenever someone says that to me, my honest response is, well, you are focusing on the wrong thing. Worship isn't for you to get something. It's for you to give something. Give praise. Give honour. Give obedience to God. That's the difference between self-centred and God-centred worship. So, young people, when we sing an old hymn written years and years ago, don't think, what an old song. Why don't we sing something newer? Don't focus on your personal preference. Just focus on Jesus and sing. This isn't the style I prefer, but there are lots of others here who like this style. I'm so grateful for the older folks in our church who have faithfully served, prayed and worked for the Lord. And after all, worship isn't about my preferences. It's all about God. And join in singing that hymn with a heart that is full of praise for God. And when your heart is full, you can't help but sing. That's what Mary did. And older people, when we sing a new spiritual song, don't think, I don't like this as much as the old hymns. We're just singing the same words over and over and over again. <laughs> Start focusing on our personal preference and focus on God. Tell ourselves, this isn't my favourite style. But there are many here who like it. I'm so grateful we have all ages of people in our church. I've got to remember, worship isn't about my preferences. It's about God and his greatness. Sing that song from our heart. Because when our heart is full, we can't help but sing. That's what Mary did. Well, there's one final thing we can discover from Mary's song. We can learn about the result of worship. Verse 56 could be called, What to do after we finish singing praises to God. And what do most people do after worship? Nothing. <laughs> Unless they have a cup of coffee, of course. Nothing. They just leave. Do you see what Mary did? Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Why did she stay? She stayed to be of service to Elizabeth. Pregnancy is a tough experience, I'm told. Even for younger women. Elizabeth faced many physical challenges because of her pregnancy. I can picture young Mary staying to help while at the same time dealing with the early weeks of her own pregnancy. And this is a beautiful picture of what happens after we have a powerful experience of worship. When we focus on the kindness and mercy of God, we become more like him. The supernatural byproduct of worship is a desire to show kindness to others. I think the only way we can serve the Lord with gladness is to let our service flow out of our heart that is full of worship. So many people work hard for God. That's good. But then they seldom truly worship. And that's not so good. They almost think that their good deeds are a substitute for worship. They work for Jesus, but seldom sit at his feet and adore and praise him. 
And then there are others. They come into church and have a powerful worship experience and are moved by God. But when they leave church, they forget all about it and they don't ever serve the Lord. They're just waiting for their next worship service. Work without worship is pretense. Worship without work is presumption. But worship that leads to work is precious to God. Do we see the connection between praise and service? Listen to Hebrews. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. That's worship. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. That's work. Notice praise itself is a sacrifice when life is going great. It's no great sacrifice to praise God. It takes up a bit of your time, but it's no great deal. Praising God during pain becomes more a sacrifice and valuable to God. And do we see that praise becomes the fruit of our lips? An inner feeling of appreciation for God is not enough. Praise must be expressed with our lips so that it can be heard. When we confess Jesus is Lord, others hear it and are moved. Have we ever had an experience of worship like Mary's? Have we fallen so deeply in love with God that our heart, well, it's just bursting with praise? That's God's plan for us. Christina Rossetti lived from 1830 to 1894. She was the daughter of an Italian immigrant, a woman of striking beauty. Because her fiancé drifted from a commitment to Christ, she broke the engagement and remained single all her life. She wrote this poem about the birth of Christ. In the bleak midwinter, a stable place sufficed for the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I'd give him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I'd do my part. But what can I give him? I'll give him my heart. We are in the presence of God. Is our heart full? Do we remember the first scene from the sound of music? Well, we ought to be singing. My heart is alive with the joy of worship.